Hello, I'm the Electrofogy. A lot of my commenters in my videos have been asking questions about basic electricity. How do resistors work? What are volts? And that sort of thing. And uh, I know that there are a lot of people that want to know about complex topics, but sometimes it's good to hit on the basics. Now the thing is, on YouTube there are a lot of videos which explain basic electricity. So it would kind of be pointless and silly of me to make another one. But you know what? Pointless and silly is pretty much my entire life. So, let's get to it. Basic electricity consists of three different things that are kind of interrelated. I want to talk first about volts. What are they? Well, voltage is the difference in electrical energy between two points. It's very important to stress that it has to be a difference in electrical energy. Now, what is electrical energy? Any time you have a force acting on some thing, that thing has energy of some kind. For example, this rock has mass and the force of gravity is being applied to it. If this rock falls, it possesses kinetic energy, and this energy can make the rock do useful work. What kind of work can a falling rock do? Well, imagine there's a nice raw oyster on the sidewalk below. And if I drop this rock on it, it'll break the oyster shell open, and I can have lunch. However, as I hold the rock, even if it's not falling, it still has energy. We call this potential energy, because it could be doing useful work, but it isn't, since the rock is being held back. We can kind of think of the rock's weight as potential energy. Now, weight isn't energy. Weight is a force. But weight and energy are related. Both depend on the mass of the rock and the force, gravity. If the rock has greater mass, or if gravity is higher, like on Jupiter, the rock would have greater weight and could do more work, so it would have greater energy. So there's a correlation between weight and potential energy. When I release the rock, the potential energy is converted to kinetic energy, and there's no more potential energy, and the rock is weightless. Now let's say I have a parachute tied to this rock. The parachute will resist the fall of the rock and hold the rock back as it falls. So part of the rock's energy is kinetic, and part of it is still potential. If the parachute is big enough, the rock won't have enough kinetic energy to break the oyster open, and I go hungry! One final thing about potential energy. The amount of potential energy depends on where you measure it. For example, if I measure the potential energy, or weight, of this rock, it's very heavy if I put the scale here, because that's in line with the force of gravity. If I put the scale here, beside the rock, and measure its weight, with force or potential energy, there will be no weight, because no force is pushing the rock in this direction. So holding the oyster over here, and letting the rock fall, won't affect the oyster. There's no potential energy between the rock and that point. Anyway, enough about rocks. In fluids, the potential energy is somewhat like pressure. I know pressure is not energy, it's a force, a force per square unit, but remember, Potential energy dictates how much work can be done if that energy is released. The higher the fluid's pressure, the higher its potential energy is, and the more work that fluid can do if it's released. The higher the pressure, the faster the turbine, or the higher the jet of water can go from a fireman's hose, etc., are all affected by pressure. In this case, the pressure is the result of my squeezing the bottle. So, like weight, there is a correlation between pressure and potential energy.
And once again, the amount of potential energy in any fluid depends on where you measure it. If I measured the potential or pressure difference between these two points, there would be none. Since the fluid at both those points is under the same pressure, no pressure difference, if I release the fluid on the top, it wouldn't flow toward the bottom and it wouldn't do any work. However, if I measure the potential energy or pressure difference between these two points, it would be very high. If I release the water, it'll flow toward the second point and do work. So the potential energy here is the difference in energy levels, the difference in pressure between two points. Electricity behaves a lot like fluid under pressure. What happens is a conductor, or any electronic component, is already full of electrons. Now we can make these electrons move if we apply a force to them. In this case, the force is voltage. I'm sure many of you have seen this trick done at a party. one that you probably haven't seen before. Phew! <laughs> now, there is a force that draws the balloon and attracts it to the wall. There's a force that pushes the two balloons apart. That force is electromotive force, also called voltage. Now voltage is a force, so it isn't energy. However, the higher our voltage is, the more useful work we can do. The light will be brighter, the motor will spin faster, the stove will be hotter, etc. This means that if we hold the electrons in place, by turning off the switch, for example, higher voltage will mean more potential energy. So there's a correlation between voltage and potential energy. By the way, I'm not a physicist, so sometimes I make the mistake of saying that the weight or pressure or voltage is potential energy. That's not really true. Those are forces. So if you hear me saying that, just remember that I'm only making a small mistake. The stronger the force, the more energy there is. Just as with weight or pressure, the potential energy and voltage of electricity depends on where you measure it. If you measure the voltage between two points on the same wire, there will be no difference in voltage because the electrons at both those points are being affected by the same force, voltage. So releasing an electron at this end of the wire will have no effect, just like two atoms of fluid in a pressurized container. However, if you measure the voltage between two different wires, the two wires can have different voltages, and the voltage difference can do useful work. So a difference in voltage between two points represents potential energy. So voltage is the potential energy difference between two points electrically. Now the reason these two points may have different levels of electricity can be a lot of things. They could each be connected to opposite ends of a battery. They could be connected to a solar cell, perhaps a windmill, a generator or dynamo. They could be two nerves that get their energy from neurochemical activity in my brain. Whatever it is, these two points have different levels of electrical energy. And we measure that electrical energy in volts. Now, volts, like gravity and pressure, is a force. The voltage force is caused by an imbalance between the number of electrons and the number of protons in an atom. You see, atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are positively charged, and electrons are negatively charged. Electrons repel electrons, protons repel protons, and electrons attract protons. In the atom, the protons and neutrons are held in the center, or nucleus, of the atom, and the electrons orbit around them. 
don't worry about why the protons don't repel each other and fly apart, and why the electrons don't get attracted to the protons and rush in to contact the nucleus. That's just the way atoms are. In your average atom, the number of protons and electrons are the same. Since there's a balance between negatively charged electrons and positively charged protons, the entire atom is referred to as having no charge, or being neutrally charged, balanced. There are charged things inside the atom, but overall, there's no net charge on that atom. However, if this atom has too many or too few electrons compared to the protons, then the whole atom becomes charged one way or the other. If you take away an electron, the atom becomes positively charged. If you add an electron, the atom becomes negatively charged. This process of adding or subtracting an electron is called ionizing the atom, and it usually requires a lot of energy to make an atom charged. When the atom is charged, it'll attract or repel other charged atoms, and you can get actual physical force this way. That's what I was doing with the balloons a few minutes ago. I was transferring electrons to the balloon from my hair, so the balloons became negatively charged and my hair became positively charged. At the end of that experiment, the electrical force of the ionized balloons made them stick to the neutrally charged wall and repel each other. It also made my positively charged hair stand up. So, when one thing has a surplus of electrons, and another thing has a shortage of electrons, then these two things will have a difference in charge, and this causes there to be a force to attract the electrons from one thing to the other. This is what causes voltage, the electromotive force that drives electrons in a current through some conductor or other set of components. Now, as I said before, it can take a lot of energy to ionize an atom. However, Conductors are different. They can be ionized easily, so it's easy to add or subtract electrons from a conductor atom. Because these things are easy to ionize, applying a voltage force to a conductor, like a wire, actually causes the electrons themselves to move from atom to atom. So the atoms of a conductor don't move, just the electrons orbiting the atom move from atom to atom. Some conductors take more voltage force than others to get electrons moving. These substances are more difficult to ionize. An easy to ionize atom, like copper, will conduct electricity easily. A substance like graphite, which is a form of carbon, requires more energy to ionize, so the same amount of voltage applied to the copper and the graphite would produce less electron flow through the graphite. This is why we make resistors out of graphite. So, when one thing has a surplus of electrons and another thing has a shortage of electrons, then these two things will have a difference in voltage, and this causes there to be a force to attract the electrons from one thing to the other. However, this voltage can't really do anything by itself. If there's no way for the electrons to get from one thing to another, and those things can't move, then the voltage force is being held back. It is therefore contributing to potential energy. If we place some sort of conductor or resistive load between the two points, there is now a way for electrons to move from one thing to another, even if these two things can't move themselves. Because the voltage force can now move electrons along, the energy is no longer potential. When we allow fluid to move along a pipe, the pressure behind that fluid causes it to flow along, so current is the result of fluid and pressure. When we apply voltage to a resistive load, electrons are pushed along by the voltage force and electric current is the result. The amount of electric current depends on two things, how much voltage force there is to move the electrons and how much resistance there is opposing that movement. If there's more voltage force, then there's more current more electrons are moved along. If there's less voltage, then there's less current. For a set amount of voltage, if there's less resistance, the amount of current will be greater. If there's more resistance to flow, there will be less current. A scientist named Georg Ohm worked on this a while back. You may have heard his name before. We call this relationship between voltage, resistance, and current Ohm's Law. Let's talk for a moment about Ohm's Law, though. 
Many people remember Ohm's law in this form. Voltage equals current times resistance. It seems like the easiest way to remember the law. Now this is correct as far as it goes, but this can sometimes cause confusion. You see, when we have an equation in the form of x times y equals something, it usually implies that the something is created by x and y, and that's not always the case. Let me show you how math can sometimes be misleading. Let's say that I have a car that gets 30 miles per gallon. Now let's say that I have 10 gallons of fuel. How many miles can I travel? Well, that's 10 gallons times 30 miles per gallon, so I can travel 300 miles. Now let's rearrange that equation. Let's say that I have a car that gets 30 miles per gallon. Now let's say that I push that car 300 miles. At the end of this trip, how many gallons of fuel will be in my tank? Well, none, of course. Nature doesn't create fuel that way. If you don't believe me, try it with your own car. The thing is, the equation, 300 miles traveled divided by 30 miles per gallon equals 10 gallons, seems like it would work mathematically. However, this doesn't work in the real world. It's a bit like that with Ohm's law. Voltage equals current times resistance would seem to mean that if we apply current to a resistor, then we would create some voltage. This is not the case in nature. Current cannot exist without some voltage to drive it along, so you can't have current without voltage first. So, to think that voltage is produced by current and resistance is backwards. The best way to remember Ohm's law is like this. Current equals voltage divided by resistance. This accurately describes the physical world. You start with a voltage between two points, connect the points with a resistive load of some sort, and the result is current through that load. When the equation is in this form, it's easier to see how Ohm's law can be used to solve a problem in the real world. If we need to increase the current through something, to make a light brighter, for example, we can either raise the voltage, or lower the resistance, or both. Now, don't get me wrong. If you have an unknown voltage or resistance, and the amount of current is known, then you can rearrange the Ohm's Law equation to solve for those quantities, but that doesn't change the fact that nature is best described when we put Ohm's Law in this form. So, voltage is a force that acts on atoms or electrons. In the case of lightweight balloons, voltage can physically cause the atoms in that balloon to move. In a conductor, the force doesn't move the atoms, it just causes the electrons to move from one conductor atom to another, like pressure causing fluid to move. Now remember, voltage is caused by a surplus or scarcity of electrons in some object. If we have one area with positive voltage and one with negative voltage, and we place some sort of conductor or resistor in contact with the two, then the voltage forces will cause electrons to move through the conductor from a high voltage to a low voltage, just like fluid under pressure moves towards area of lower pressure. This also means that after a little while, the voltage will have pushed the extra electrons from the higher voltage area to the lower voltage area, so at some point, the same amount of electrons will be at both points. The electrons at both points will be in balance, there isn't any difference in voltage between the two points, and current flow stops. You see this sort of thing with lightning bolts, or static shocks, or spark plugs in your car. You have high voltage difference, electrons are conducted between the two points, and then there's no more activity. This is fun to watch, but it's not very useful to us. We need to have electronic devices that can run for hours or days at a time. This requires a voltage source that won't decrease as current flows. The voltage difference is maintained by somehow keeping the amount of electrons in either end unbalanced, so voltage keeps the current going continuously. The way we do this is to arrange our resistors and conductors and stuff in a circuit and make sure that the voltage source is continuing to work to keep the positive side positive and the negative side negative. Now, what is a circuit? A circuit is any kind of circular route or movement that starts and finishes at the same place.
For example, this racetrack at Daytona is more formally known as the Daytona Racing Circuit. It's roughly circular in route, and all the cars going around it eventually end up at the start point again. I know this doesn't exactly look like a circuit, but you have to imagine these points here like switches that control the flow of traffic. On one day, the traffic route will look like this for a NASCAR race, and on another day, the traffic route will look like this for a Can-Am or GT race. I like that kind. Anyway, for electronic components to be in a circuit, you have to have a voltage supply that will maintain the electron imbalance between the positive voltage side and the negative voltage side at a constant level. This means that as electrons make their way through the circuit from the negative side to the positive side, the voltage source has to then move the electrons back down to the negative side for reuse. This means that the voltage supply device has to be some form of electron pump that moves electrons back to their starting point so that the circuit continues to function. In a battery, this is done by chemistry. As the chemicals inside the battery decay, electrons are taken away from the positive end and sent toward the negative end. The battery doesn't just emit electrons, it pumps electrons through itself and maintains its voltage difference. With a power supply that plugs into the wall, energy from the power company keeps the electrons cycling from positive back to negative where they keep flowing through our circuit. Now, of course, that battery is going to run out of chemicals at some point, and the electron flow will stop, but we can then replace it with a fresh battery, or recharge the one it has, and the circuit will continue to function. In fact, with a laptop, computer, or cell phone, you can recharge the battery without removing it from the device, and the item can theoretically run for years on end. So, that's how a circuit is. There has to be a continuous path from the negative pole of the power source through the circuit components to the positive terminal of the power source, and the power source keeps the electrons pumping through itself and back around again. If the electrons flow anywhere else besides that path, then it's not a circuit. The electrons in the system will get drawn out to someplace else, and bad things could happen. The power supply may not be able to keep up with this extra draw and be damaged, or the escaping electrons could shock you or something. Just bear in mind that in a proper circuit, the electrons always have to have a closed path from the end of the circuit through the power supply and back to the starting point, which is what a circuit is. Here's another interesting fact about circuits. The force of gravity has no effect on a circuit. The reason for that is gravity is pulling down on all the points of a circuit equally as the electrons move up and as they move down within a circuit. It's like this clock. As time goes by, the minute hand rotates downward from the 12 o'clock position to the 6 o'clock position. As it does, gravity is pulling the hands of the clock down, and the clock runs a bit faster. However, for the second half of the hour, the minute hand rises from the 6 back to the 12, which is the starting point of its path. As it goes, gravity is pulling against the minute hand, and this causes the clock to run slower. However, since the force of gravity is acting equally on both the downstroke and the upstroke of the minute hand, the amount that the clock is sped up is equal to the amount that it's slowed down later, so the clock remains accurate overall, and the net effect of gravity is zero. This is true of any kind of circuit, whether it's a racetrack or an electric circuit. Because gravity affects the entire path of the circuit equally, the net effect of gravity is zero. This is why the lights on the top floor of a tall building are equally as bright as the ones in the basement. There's one other thing I'd like to mention here about electrons. Newer textbooks for beginning students are starting to use the word charges instead of electrons. This is a good thing. Physicists and engineers have been doing this for ages, and it's best to start off talking about charges for beginners. But it's still early days, and the textbooks are changing slowly. The word charge is short for charged ion. In other words, an atom that has too many or too few electrons, like I was talking about before. This charge can be either positive or negative, and opposite charges attract while like charges repel. The thing is, current is really about the flow of charges through a conductor. 
I did a video about charges before, and if you really want to know what electrons are actually doing in a circuit, you can click here to watch it. It's kind of long and boring, though. Let me just summarize by saying that as electrons go from one atom to a second one, that makes the second atom a negative charge and the first atom a positive charge. Since these two atoms change their charges at the same time, we can see that as electrons move, it can look like negative charges are moving toward positive or positive charges are moving toward negative. Scientists saw how charges move along with electrons and decided to call the flow of negative charges electron flow current and the flow of positive charges conventional current. Wouldn't you know it, because the scientists couldn't see the electrons, they decided that conventional current was the better way of describing circuit behavior. Studying charges shows us that both electron flow or conventional current are equally valid to describe current. And because just about everybody in the world uses conventional current, that's what I use. Don't worry too much about it. Just remember to make a choice between electron flow and conventional current and say which one you're using when you talk about a circuit. You can't use both at the same time in a circuit. It's either one or the other. Now let's get back to circuits. An electronic circuit is made when you have your components arranged in a path that goes from one terminal of your power supply to the other, and that power supply then pumps the electrons back to the point where they started. All circuits have to have this closed loop to function. The thing is, for a simple circuit like this, its operation is fairly easy to understand. However, when you start looking at more complex circuits, they may not look like circuits anymore. To illustrate this, let me read you a comment from one of the viewers of my videos regarding a circuit of mine. This comment refers to the voltage divider circuit I covered in the video entitled, What is a Transistor Part 2? The comment goes like this. I see that in the voltage divider, some of the current has to flow to ground. Is this always the case, or is there a way to save that current? Well, obviously we save the current. It's a circuit. In a circuit, all the current has to go all the way around the circuit and come back and go through to where it starts. If all the current doesn't come back and go back to where it starts, it's not a circuit. Now the thing is, it's true that this person has uh, misunderstood one or two things, but that's not their fault. That's my fault. Because whenever someone draws a schematic, especially if we're trying to uh, demonstrate one particular principle, we're going to leave out a whole bunch of other extraneous stuff because we want to concentrate on the principle and not the operation of the whole circuit. Now for a person who is familiar with some electronics, they'll understand this and they'll get it. But an absolute beginner that looks at one of my circuits, well, it's going to look incomplete. They won't see how that works. So let's revisit that example of voltage divider that I put in there and let me put back the bits that I left out. And maybe now that circuit will make a little more sense. Here's the circuit again. It's a voltage divider with two resistors in series. Current flows through the two resistors and the voltage measured across the bottom resistor depends on the size of the resistors and the input voltage. Now the first thing I want to deal with is the input and output voltages of the circuit. I just have them labeled as voltage in and voltage out. However, voltage is actually meaningless unless it's measured between two points. So which two points am I talking about? Well, unless specified otherwise, the voltages are measured between the point that's labeled and the common voltage reference terminal, or common. The common voltage is the voltage at some point that all other voltages are compared to, the zero point in the circuit, a point that you would say it has zero volts on it. In our circuit here, as in most circuits, the common terminal is the negative terminal of the battery or power supply. That's not always the case. 
In old cars, the positive terminal of the battery was common. This actually was a good idea as it prevents corrosion, but as more and more electronic appliances appeared on cars, like radios and whatnot, it became difficult to properly connect things up when common voltages were different, so cars went with a negative common. The common reference voltage terminal is symbolized by this. Now this is actually a special version of the common terminal symbol. This symbol really means common voltage reference terminal which is connected to an earth ground so that earth is also zero volts. That's quite a mouthful, so most people just say it's the ground terminal. Now the common terminal doesn't have to be connected to an earth ground, it certainly isn't in a car or cell phone, but people still use the term ground or earth as the zero voltage point, even if nothing is attached to earth. We can use this symbol, which just means common reference voltage terminal, or this symbol, which means common reference voltage terminal connected to the chassis. I'm not going to go into why an earth ground is needed today, that'll be another video, but for now, just remember that this thing means zero volts, or common. Getting back to our voltage divider circuit, we see that there are the two resistors connected to common, and there's one meter connected between the input voltage and common, and another meter connected between the output and common. Since these share a connection to common, then that means they must be connected to each other. So let's add that connection to our drawing. Also at this point, I'm going to get rid of the ground symbol. It's not really necessary. No current should be going into the ground, even though it's attached to ground, because then the circuit wouldn't work. Incidentally, this connection between the points is called a node. If you measure the voltage at any point on this node, it will be the same. Now the last thing I left out of this circuit diagram is the source of the input voltage. I told you that it's there, and that it's 10 volts in the video, but I didn't show you where it came from and how it's attached. So let's add that to our schematic. Here is the source of the voltage, a 10 volt battery. I don't know why they make 9 volt batteries. Calculations would be so much easier if they made the things 10 volts. Anyway, the battery's negative terminal is connected to the common node, just like usual, and the positive terminal of the battery is connected to the input voltage point, or node, at the top of the schematic. Now that we've added all of the missing parts to our schematic, let's see how the circuit operates. I'll show you using conventional current and positive charge flow, because that's how I roll. Positive voltage from the battery's positive terminal makes current flow through the two resistors and into the negative terminal of the battery, where the chemicals in the battery pull the charges through the battery from negative to positive, and then they leave the positive battery terminal and continue to cycle around the circuit path. As far as the output voltage goes, the voltage measured at the output, which is across the 200 ohm resistor, is proportional to the ratio of the two resistor values and is always less than the input voltage. There isn't any current going through the two voltmeters. They're designed so that they don't allow current to flow through them so they won't alter the workings of the circuit when they're attached to it. So, that's pretty much the story on the way that circuit works. But, I've still got a lot of other people who ask me questions about that particular circuit. Like this one. I'd love to get a better understanding of why the voltage divider works the way it does. I get it. I understand the math and the rules of a voltage divider. I just don't have a full understanding of why it actually works in the way that it does. Well, of course you don't. You're not a plumber. Remember that voltage in a circuit is potential energy, much like pressure is potential energy in a system of plumbing. And the thing is, anytime you have resistance to flow, it's just like having a restriction in pipes. And plumbers have to deal with pressure drops due to uh, flow restrictions all day long. That's all they do. I mean, honestly, if you want to hear some interesting stuff about physics, just talk to a plumber sometime. 
Ask him what it takes to flush a toilet on the 89th floor of a skyscraper. Or in the 5th sub-basement. There's a lot going on there. They're actually pretty heavy duty in applied physics. Now, you know, like I say, you're not a plumber. I'm not, actually. I pretty much uh, just found out about this sort of thing through engineering courses. But to help you, I've made some plumbing. Now, this is my bit of plumbing. It has a reservoir on the right, and there's a bit of black tape around it. This represents the fluid level in the reservoir, and I'll try to keep the reservoir full to that level at all times. The reservoir is connected to a pipe, which goes to the left. The pipe has two valves in it, so that I can control the resistance to flow at two points in the pipe. There are also three transparent tubes running vertically at different points from the pipe. One before the first valve, one between the two valves, and one after the valves. These will let us see the pressure at these points as the valves change their resistance. Finally, the pipe ends on the left and empties out into another container. This doesn't look like a circuit, but as the experiment runs, I'll be taking fluid from the left and transferring it back up to the reservoir on the right, so the fluid ends up back where it starts, making this a proper circuit. For the fluid, I'm going to use sugar-free cherry Kool-Aid, because it'll be easier to see, and because it won't hurt anything if I spill it, and mainly because I hate that stuff. Here we have the pipe with both valves closed. In other words, both valves are at maximum flow resistance. Fluid in the pipe is pressurized by gravity and air pressure, and this forces Kool-Aid up into the first pressure tube, all the way up until it's at the level of the reservoir. This indicates that, at this point on the pipe, the pressure is equal to that in the reservoir. Since there's no resistance to the flow between the reservoir and this first tube, the fluid level in the first tube will always be the same as it is in the reservoir. Now here, I've opened the valve on the right, so it now has no resistance to flow. The valve on the left is still closed. Now fluid can go through the pipe with minimal resistance through the first valve, and this causes the fluid to rise in the middle pressure tube between the valves. Under these conditions, the pressure in the pipe between the valves is the same as that in the reservoir, so the fluid in the middle tube is at the same height as it is in the reservoir. Now I've opened both the valves to about 70% open. Each valve now has the same resistance to flow through it, and the Kool-Aid flows all the way out of the left end of the pipe. On the right, before the first valve, the pressure tube tells us that the pressure before the first valve is equal to the pressure in the reservoir. But now, we see the pressure between the two valves is a lot less than the reservoir pressure, and the pressure after the two valves on the left is nothing. Where'd the pressure go? To answer that, we have to go back to potential energy. Pressure is not energy, it's a force, but pressure and energy are related. Before the Kool-Aid enters the first valve, it hasn't lost any energy since there's no resistance to flow up until that point. Pushing the Kool-Aid through that first valve subjects it to flow restriction, which is friction, and it takes some energy to push it through. This is why there's less pressure after the first valve. The fluid has less energy at that point. However, the fluid still has some potential energy, since it still has to go through the second valve. When the fluid has passed through the second valve, there's no further resistance to flow. Remember, potential energy describes the amount of work that could be done if we release the fluid from its restriction. But after the second valve, there's no more restriction, so all energy is now kinetic flow energy, and there's no potential energy anymore. This is why the pressure tube on the left indicates no pressure after the first two valves. What these pressure drops are showing us is the principle of conservation of energy. On the right, there's all the potential energy. In the middle, some of the energy is turned to heat energy from friction, and there's less potential energy, less pressure. 
And on the far right, some energy is turned to heat at the valve, and the remaining energy is kinetic flow. There's no potential energy, and the Kool-Aid pours into the bucket, or close to it. So this is one of those times where we have to see the link between force and energy, and how changes in energy can cause the driving force to change. The next experiment kind of looks the same, except I've set both valves to about 25% open. The pressure levels in the system are about the same, since both valves are set to about the same value. However, note that the flow on the system at the far left is much smaller than before. The ratio of the pressure drops is the same, but the valves flow a lot less, so the overall output flow is less. This kind of makes sense. It takes more energy to force the Kool-Aid through the smaller openings, so more energy is needed. At the end, there's a lot less energy changing to kinetic, so the output flow is less powerful. For a final look at pressure and energy in this system, let's see two more examples. In this first example, I have the valve on the right set to about 75% closure, and the valve on the left set to 25% closure. The level in the middle indicator tube shows that the pressure at this point is very low. This is due to conservation of energy. It takes a certain amount of energy to force the Kool-Aid through both valves, but it takes a lot of energy at the right valve and not so much energy at the left, so most of the pressure is dropped at the right valve and just a little bit is dropped on the left. I wish there were a way to show you the pressure drops at each valve, but the rightmost indicator tube can only display the pressure of the entire system. So we have to take the pressure at that point and subtract the pressure at the middle indicator to see how much system pressure is lost over the first valve. I'm sure an actual plumber could figure out a way to display this, but I'm not that good. In this last example, the rightmost valve is set to 25% and the leftmost valve is set to 75%. This time, a small amount of energy is required at the first valve, and a large amount at the second valve. So the pressure drops only slightly on the right valve, and most of the system pressure is dropped on the left. I'm sure there are a few of you who would like to see what happens if I completely open both valves. Well, theoretically, it should look like this. If there's no flow resistance from the system, there's no potential energy anywhere, no pressure, and we should see all indicator tubes empty and all kinds of flow from the left into the output bucket. I'm not going to lie to you, though. This is a Photoshop faked picture because the valves I have, even when wide open, still have a flow restriction. So the indicator tubes have tiny levels at the first two points. These valves are kind of crappy. And if I got better valves, maybe my indications would be better. But, I mean, I've already sunk 50 bucks into this, so give me a break. Enough with the Kool-Aid energy conservation test. Let's concentrate on electronics again. This is our voltage divider circuit with everything visible. The circuit is a simple series circuit, and current flows through the two resistors one after the other. In each resistor, some energy is converted to heat, which means that after that resistor, there's less energy and less voltage for the rest of the circuit, just like there was less pressure past a flow restriction in a pipe. Now, if we want to know exactly how much voltage is being dropped across a component, we can use Ohm's Law several times to calculate everything out. Now, most references on the web use this method of calculation, which is based on finding the total current first. We need to find the total circuit resistance, which is 300 ohms, then use Ohm's law with the input voltage and total resistance to find circuit current. Well, that's 10 volts over 300 ohms to get 33 milliamps. Using Ohm's law again, we can find the voltage drop across an individual resistor by multiplying circuit current times that resistance. So for R1, we get 3.33 volts, and for R2, we get 6.67 volts. For a simple series circuit, there's an easier way. This is the method I used in my What is a Transistor video part 2. What you can do is replace the current term in the equation with its Ohm's law equivalent voltage over resistance. 
We can rewrite the equation a little on account of the community of law of multiplications, and the final equation looks like this. Voltage drop across that resistor is input voltage times the resistor divided by the sum of all resistors. This way I don't have to fool with calculating current, I just add resistors, divide my resistance by that sum, and multiply that by the input voltage to find that resistor voltage. To write that a little more clearly, the voltage of Rx, any resistor, is input voltage times that resistor divided by the sum of all resistors in the circuit. It makes things a little easier to deal with, so that's why I used it in the other video. No matter which way you use for the calculation, you should see that the voltage dropped across the first resistor is 3.33 volts, and the voltage dropped across the second resistor is 6.67 volts. The voltage across both resistors is 10 volts. This makes sense, since when we measure voltage across the two resistors, we're also measuring voltage at the battery, which is fixed at 10 volts. So current, conventional current anyway, starts at the positive terminal of the battery, flows through R1, then R2, and then to common negative terminal of the battery. The voltage before R1 is 10 volts between there and common. The voltage reading at the output point is 6.67 volts between there and common. And the voltage after R2, which is the common terminal, is zero. This is just like my plumbing setup from before. At the start, my voltage is equal to the supply voltage. Then, as current pushes through R1, we lose some potential energy as it's converted to heat, so the voltage drops also to 6.67 volts at that point. After the current has pushed through R2, it arrives at the common terminal where there's no more resistance, no potential energy, so there's zero volts at that point. So just like our pressure experiments, the operation of a voltage divider circuit depends on the principle of conservation of energy in this case potential energy, and as energy is used in the resistors, voltage drops after them, just like pressure drops following a flow restriction. So, what good is a voltage divider circuit? Well, there's all kinds of things we use them for. Think about this. Let's say we want to have a circuit whose output is 5 volts compared to common. Let's say that we also have a problem here we don't know what the value of R2 is. It could be anything, and it may change once we have it installed. Well, what we do to solve that problem is to get ourselves a component for R1 that will change its resistance based on the resistance of our unknown R2 in such a way that an output of 5 volts is maintained across R2. One other thing we need to do is make sure the supply voltage is much greater than the output, like 17 volts or 25 volts. The name of the component at the R1 position is a voltage regulator. By changing the resistance of R1 compared to R2, the regulator can keep 5 volts supplied to R2 no matter how big or small R2 is. Voltage regulator. It's a fancy way of saying variable resistor in a voltage divider. And that's essentially how a power supply works. There are all kinds of voltage dividers out there, and I'd say that just about all circuits used out there today contain some form of voltage divider in them. Amplifiers, computer logic, it's voltage dividers all over the place. Now, I'd like to say a few words about parallel circuits. Here, I've rearranged my circuit so that it's two resistors in parallel rather than in series. Now, in this circuit, all the voltages are going to be 10 volts, because if you measure across any resistor, you'll also be measuring the battery, since they're all connected to the battery's nodes. The purpose of this circuit is to provide different amounts of current at different places. To see why, I want you to think of a movie theater. Let's say that the movie has just ended and people are in the lobby trying to get out. So there's potential energy here, people pressure or voltage against those doors. Now if I open one door, one person at a time can get through. This will be one unit of people resistance. 
If I open two doors at once, one person at a time can get through each of these doors, so twice as many people can exit the lobby than before. By opening a second path of identical resistance, the total resistance of the system has been cut in half. If twice as many people are flowing out, then that must mean there's less resistance, half as much. Let's say that I open the second door twice as wide. Now two people can leave through the second door, meaning that its resistance has been cut in half. Now in total, three people at a time can leave the lobby at once. So compared with a lone door, this setup is one-third the resistance. So this movie theater is just one big parallel circuit. Opening more doors, or changing their width, adds more circuit paths and raises the output current. Actually, this isn't a circuit, since people are not cycling back through the back door and into the lobby again. They're taking off for dinner or going home or wherever. So sooner or later, this will run down, there'll be no one left in the lobby, and I have to lock the doors back up again. Getting back to our circuit here, let's take a look at this. R2 is 200 ohms. Given that the voltage across R2 is 10 volts, Ohm's law tells us that the current across R2 is 50 milliamps. Ohm's law tells us that the current for R1 is 100 milliamps, and this makes sense. R1 is half as big as R2, so it'll have twice the current going through it. Total circuit current supplied by the battery is therefore 150 milliamps. If we make R1 larger, less current will flow through it, and total circuit resistance will rise. If we add a third resistor in parallel, then there's another path for current to flow, which means higher current flow, so the total amount of circuit resistance falls. By now, you should have a better understanding of circuits, both series and parallel, and how voltage and energy work together. Also, when you see an advanced circuit that seems to be missing a lot of stuff, you can read it, mentally add the stuff back in, and understand the circuit you're looking at much better. So, in electronics, it starts with the potential energy, voltage. This voltage is applied to a circuit. This circuit has load resistance, and because there's a path for the charges or electrons to flow, it creates current. Current transfers the energy from whatever voltage source it is to whatever the load circuit is, and useful things are done. And that's electronics in a nutshell. Thanks for watching. Next phase of the experiment. Whoa, hey, what what the heck? Uh, wait a minute. Oh, that's just bubbles. Let's see what happens after the bubbles settle out. There, just as expected.